We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. George Hallis, who is considered by many to be the founder of the NFL and who was the first coach and owner of the Chicago Bears, they used to have Towboys back in the day. And whoever was the home team would have Towboys for both sides, okay? But what he was known to do was employ those Towboys and have them report back to him from the conversations that were held on the sidelines or in the locker room. And then they would come back and whisper his little secrets. They were his canaries and whispering secrets back to him about what was going on. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's Super Bowl special, I'm joined by author Kevin Bryant, and we discuss his book, Spies on the Sidelines, the high-stakes world of NFL espionage. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for £3 a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks a bunch, Chris. Great to have you on. For the benefit of listeners, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your career in the in the Army and Department of Defense? Yeah. So I spent um, eight years in the Army um, as a special agent, hopped out, mm. uh, became a civilian, still working for the Army, uh, worked another five years as a special agent. Um, I'm still working for the Army now. I've been in for... 24 years total of experience uh, collecting and protecting information. Um, and yeah, so I've got, um, I've got a master's degree in intelligence studies. I've got a, um, a second one in sports management. So kind of yeah. combine those two for the book. And um, yeah, I'm a French and Arabic linguist. So I spent a lot of time dabbling in, in languages and spending time studying. You mentioned you were a special agent in the Department of Defense. It'd be interesting to know a little bit about that, sort of like what the life is like as a special agent and how it differs from being in other agencies such as the FBI, DSS, or CIA. Yeah, I would say the main difference is uh, we get our hands dirty a lot. So, you know, um, you know, the FBI, obviously, it's mainly geared to be stateside. You know, you've got overseas agencies that are mainly, you know, they're doing the cocktail circuit and all that type of stuff, right? Um, and then you've got the Army, which is, you know, and Department of Defense in general, which is really geared towards, um, you know, wartime. So, you know, it's often, sometimes it's a challenge finding stuff to do in peacetime. Uh, when you're back home, yeah. you're stationed back home, right? You go through a lot of training. They keep you, you know, well-trained and, and there are missions and there are things to do, obviously. Uh, but, um, you know, our, obviously our bread and butter is when we're deployed. And so I've, I've 
had five wonderful deployments to uh, all the places that you never want to go to in life. And um, yeah, I mean, it's real very quickly, you know? And so it, it's, it's an interesting job. You know, I bounce between being in a suit and tie um, one week and then the next week I'm, you know, dressed up tactically and, you know, um, holding a long range rifle, if not bigger stuff than that. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, your glove box can be packed with, you know, all, you know, six different types of grenades and, you know, you've got a, you know, a law and a saw on the back of the vehicle and it's, you know, it's, it's a different lifestyle. Yeah. 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 Go. You're, you're making me picture, um, uh, Jack Ryan a little bit from like the, uh, maybe the Harrison Ford era rather than the more recent one, <laughs> which is the film with the sniper and then, uh, and he's hiding in the bushes and they're trying to sort of find him. I'm thinking of that scene. I can't remember which film that is now. I think it's clear and present danger. <laughs> well, it's very interesting. You know, my last deployment, I had a, a group of Rangers that did, uh, you know, our, um, basically our protection detail and, you know, yeah. they're, we're rolling out and they're like, man, I hope we get in a firefight. And I'm rolling out, well, that's the last thing in the world I want to see, you know? So, I, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't wish any of that stuff on me, so. <laughs> no, no, fair enough, fair enough. Well, look, you, you, you've written this fantastic book called Spies on the Sidelines, which looks at espionage by teams within the NFL. So what drew you to this topic and how did you go about researching it? Yeah, so to start with, you know, it was just, I got interested in, in the topic after Spygate, after a few other spying incidents. So I just started on the internet. You know, I just wanted to see, hey, what's really out there? How common is this type of stuff? And that's where I began. And I, I found a lot of stories, a lot of great anecdotes. But what I realized is like, there's no, there's no repository, okay? Um, they're all spread out here and there through, you know, newspaper articles or website articles for as long as the NFL has gone on pretty much. Yeah, and so yeah. I, wanting to read more, I hopped on the, you know, I hopped on Amazon and was like, Hey, you know, let me, let me search this. Um, found out there's no, there's no book on that subject. And so I started the process of, okay, said, okay, I, I want to write, I'm going to write this. And so, um, I bought a ton of books written, uh, that were either written by or, um, written about NFL coaches. So I went through about 50 of those, um, just picking out the pieces that, you know, fit the subject of my book. And then I started going through interviews, which was challenging because obviously the NFL is a very hush hush, uh, subject, especially when it comes to how do you gather information on your opponents? Mm, mm. And, you know, no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to taint careers of, you know, coaches or players or, or anything along those lines. When you're a member of a team, you typically sign a non-disclosure agreement, which adds another layer of secrecies to the whole process. So it was challenging. Um, the interviews that I did, um, you know, managed to undertake were typically done um, by providing anonymity to, you know, to the uh, the person I interviewed. Um, so it was it was extremely challenging. It was hard to do. Um, it was tough to find all of the information that I did. Um, and there are some topics that I never, I never could flush them out quite as well as I would have liked just because of, you know, the layer of secrecy that's involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you might better get a second edition one day and tackle those bits. <laughs> yeah. So I'm writing a book now on college football, the same subject. And I find now that I'm already a published author, um, there are doors opening to me that weren't, mm. you know, that weren't, um, that were closed before. So, yeah. um, yeah, I'm finding it easier now to do the uh, round two. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, talking very generally, what kind of information would a team be seeking from their opponent? Yeah, so you've got you know three primary sorts. You've got, first of mm. all, um, all of the permissible techniques that NFL teams use. Okay, so you're going through everything but there from scouting. Film study is a big part of that today. Sifting through the media for what's available there. Um you know, a variety of, of, of different techniques that teams use there. And then you get into questionable techniques. And by questionable, I mean like, uh, well, it could be stuff like elicitation. Um, it could be using people that, um, lip readers, you know, trying to figure out what coaches are saying when they're calling plays on the sidelines or trying to intercept another team's signals that are sent in in order to decipher the upcoming play. And, and then you've got techniques that are just flat out illicit. Uh, such as using a listening device in a locker room, mm. 
which not only breaks mm. NFL rules, but breaks, you know, state and even U.S. laws. Um, so you get a mix of all of those three. And I won't go through all of the different techniques that I've identified in the book. I've got about, I think, 12 or 13 listed in here that are all, you know, different sorts that are used. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a wide variety of things that go on and we'll get to a bit more as we, you know, as we talk here, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And does collecting information on opponents really win games? Is it worth the risk? Um, so, you know, the, the short answer to that is absolutely. Um, and so I'm going to give you an example of, um, of that. So, you know, signals collections is one of those techniques that teams, you know, the Patriots obviously got caught doing that and mm -hmm. they got in trouble for um, recording another team signals. So just, are you trying to intercept them and see what they're doing and, you know, and then matching up with a play that's coming in? There's nothing wrong with that. What the NFL ultimately said was, we just don't want you recording another team signals and trying to do that. So, but, you know, it was, it was permissible for a long time um, before before Spygate came out, before 2005, 2006, when it was ultimately banned, the taping of signals. So I'll give you an example of how that impacted a game. So back in 1980, mm -hmm. when video recording signals was still permitted, um, the Chicago Bears were, you know, frequent rivals with the Packers. Okay, they're in the same conference. They play each other all the time. So what they did was the first game of the season, they ended up taping the Packers assistant coach, Zeke Bratkowski, who signaled in the offensive plays. Okay. And then they went through, they reviewed all of that tape and matched the signals to the upcoming plays. And then the second time they played that season, they were able to use that information so that when Bratkowski sent in the signal, they would have somebody who already was familiar with all these all these signals and, and the matching plays yeah. who would tell the def defensive coordinator what play the Packers were sending in. And so for the first game that season, the Packers won 12 to six for the second game. When the bears had identified those signals and knew what was coming, the bears won 61 to seven. So if you don't think that gathering information on your opponents, right, can make a difference. I think that's a great example of just what a huge, massive difference can be obtained by gathering this type of info. Yeah, yeah, wow. No, that's pretty amazing, that. You mentioned Spygate. Can you just tell us a little bit about Spygate, just because uh, there might be some listeners who are not so familiar with that. So Spygate occurred all the way from preseason of 2000 all the way to week one of the 2006 season. Yeah. And what the Patriots were, Patriots under coach Bill Belichick, who is still the Patriots coach, um, they were recording um, the signals of other teams during games. Mm. Okay. They were recording. So, you know, signals, but what do I mean by that? Well, it can be a lot of different things. Okay. It can be someone flashing hand signals. Okay. Which means yeah. that that corresponds to a certain play that they run, or it could be holding up a sign. It could be a sign with just the color. It could be the color green, mm. Mm. which means that's the play, right? So there's a bunch of different ways that you can send in signals, including even audio signals like, you know, 24 Slurpee, you know, 42, which a quarterback may use to change the play at the line of scrimmage to call an audible. So all of those are encompassed within, you know, the term signals. So what they were doing, they're filming these, they're going back and studying after the game of the, the play that matches with the signal that was sent in before. And then for future games, they try to determine, um, yeah, they use those, they, they learn them, they study them, they know them. And then when they see that play coming in, they tell the, the, the offensive coordinator, because typically it was defensive signals of what defense the opponent is about to use. Okay. So, um, they did that all the way to 2006 when they finally got in trouble. They had a former coach who went to the jets. And that Jets coach called Bill Belichick before the game, said, hey, I know what you guys do. Don't do it, especially not here in New York. And yeah. Belichick and the Patriots did it anyway. The Jets were, were prepared for it. They allowed the videographer of the Patriots to continue recording all the way up to the point where they felt, okay, we've got enough evidence. Um, mm -hmm. And then 
jet security detained that Patriots videographer. And then they brought him to NFL security. Mm. And the Patriots had all different types of means to try to cover their tracks, hiding up their logos, putting tape over the light of their um, video camera that was recording, all different things, you know, what exactly they were supposed to say to make it appear that they weren't taping the signals. But in the end, um, they got in trouble for this. And they had some pretty big fines from the NFL, and they lost draft picks because of this as well. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the various espionage techniques that have been used and you cover in your book. So the first technique I'd like to talk about is the use of informants in NFL espionage. Yeah. So there we've got, I'll, I'll give you an example of one. So, you know, there's quite, a, there's a few examples of that going on um, throughout the NFL's history. But I think the most pertinent one is probably when Coach Wee, Weeb Eubank um, went from the Browns to the Baltimore Colts, okay? So Mm -hmm. he's an assistant coach for the Browns under Coach Paul Brown. And he gets an offer to become the the Colts head coach. And, you know, Coach Paul Brown's like, okay, yeah, I get it. You know, great opportunity for you, all this kind of stuff. But he has some reservations. And his first reservation is that Weeb Eubank was responsible for preparing the entire Um, Cleveland Browns draft, okay, which is upcoming. And so Paul Brown goes to the NFL commissioner and he says, hey, Kamish, can can you make it so that Weeb Eubank can't leave the Browns until the draft is over? Because he knows all of our secrets. And the commissioner says, yeah, okay, I'm good with that. That, that's, That's reasonable. And so everything looks good, but during the draft, The Colts are picking a couple spots in front of the Browns. And guess who keeps coming off the board, you know, a couple picks early? You know, the Colts. So the Colts end up picking the Browns target round after round after round. Okay. And Paul Brown is pretty quick to pick up on what's happening. And he goes, oh, man, I think Weeb Eubank is providing the Colts information on who our targets are. Mm. But he doesn't see how that's being done. Okay. Cause he's trying to watch, he's seeing, are there any Browns, uh, you know, members that are coaching staff or whatever coming, mm-hmm. you know, coming over into this area where all the teams have different tables set up during the draft at this time. Eventually what coach Brown realizes is that a member of the media in, in Baltimore who covers the Colts is frequently coming over and talking to coach Reeb Eubank. And so he goes, oh, that's how they're passing the information. And he basically says, hey, Weeb, uh, you know, thanks for your services. I'm not going to need you for t- day two of the draft. And um, apparently, you know, in the book that Coach Paul Brown wrote, he said, yeah, I confronted Weeb about this. He said, hey, I'm sorry. I did it for my family, probably implying he was financially compensated for what went on. Um and so, you know, I think, you know, that's just one story of how um, you can actually get spies within your own organization providing information to opponents, which has happened on numerous occasions in the NFL's history. Yeah. Just to double check. So the draft is when you recruit new players, isn't it? Yeah. So what happens typically is um, the best players coming out of college football are... Mm are selected and, you know, all 32 NFL teams basically take turns um, picking the top talent that comes out. And basically the worse you do during the season, the higher you're able to draft. So, you know, the worst team has the first pick in the draft and then, you know, right on down the line. Um, And so, yeah, it's where most of the talent throughout the NFL comes in. We, you know, there's a bit that's taken from other professional leagues, other professional football leagues, and other sports like rugby. Um, sometimes we'll get some football players or even, you know, kickers, especially um, coming out of rugby. Mm-hmm. But most of them come out of college football. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Cool. Thank you for that. I'd also like to talk about the use of electronic surveillance, such as audio and video by teams in the NFL. Yeah. So obviously we had Spygate, you know, an instance of how teams use recording devices there. Um, listening devices, that's another mm-hmm. commonly feared tactic that. There's never been any proof that an NFL team has used these. Um, But having said that, um, 
it has happened in college football. Uh, one coach told another opponent, um, hey, that was amazing you beat us because I put a listening device in your locker room. We taped everything that was going on there, your pregame conversation, yeah. your uh, halftime conversation, everything. Um, but you still beat us, so kudos to you. Um, so we know what's gone on in college. Peyton Manning, you know, the star quarterback for, you know, the, the Colts and then the Broncos. Um, he, as of last year, he revealed that when the, when his teams played the Patriots in New England, um, he used to do two things. One, he didn't want to talk inside the locker room because he was very scared of, um, cameras and listening devices being used in there. Okay. So he just said, I tried not to talk when he absolutely had to talk inside of the locker room. What he would do is like, if he wanted to talk to his wide receivers and game plan a little, he would bring them into the shower room. You know, I would imagine he didn't say this, but I would imagine he turned on the water to mask mm. the sound of, mm. you know, of his voice and then talk to him that way. Um, you know, Brittany Breeze, who is the wife of Drew Breeze, you know, the uh, a re now retired but very famous New Orleans Saints quarterback. Um, when teams were vying for his services, when he was a free agent, it came down to, you know, two different teams. And um, she was so worried that one of those teams was potentially had a listening device inside of their uh, hotel room that when she wanted to talk about, you know, how she was feeling and what team she was leaning to and all of this. And to talk about Drew Brees was coming off a, you know, he had a big sh shoulder injury. So to talk about all of this stuff, she, she brought, you know, Drew into that, that bathroom and, mm -hmm. and turned on the shower um, so that they could talk in secret. So it's absolutely a fear. Um, you know, one coach would yell, you know, damn you, Al Davis. I know you're up there who is a famous coach of the Raiders because, you know, he thought when he was in, you know, the Raiders uh, locker room, you know, the visiting, um, you know, the visiting team's locker room in Oakland that, you know, Al Davis surely had that, um, that place mic'd up. And there was no proof that any of this, uh, any of these, you know, in any of these instances that there was a listening device. But you got to imagine where there's smoke and there's that much paranoia mm -hmm. and there's probably mm -hmm. fire at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's tough to it's tough to prove. But given that it's happened in college, it's pretty safe to assume at some point down the line it has happened in the pros as well. Yeah, I was talking to Fred Burton, former DSS agent many years ago, and he was telling me about they have these um, white noise generators for covert conversations that hopefully yes. defeat mics. Maybe the NFL teams need to start investing in those. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, and I'm sure teams do. Uh, you know, there's yeah. a bar. I mean, obviously you can just you use white noise from your phone. There's, you know, there's white noise machines out there. Just turning on simply a TV, mm. you know, when you're in there. Um, other coaches have resorted to as far as taping over every single hole and crack or, you know, the jam underneath your door in a locker room, taping over all of that to make sure that there's no way sound can go from inside of that room to anywhere outside. Because yeah, there's lots of devices. There's lots mm. of ways and techniques that can be exploited with, you know, directional mics, parabolic mics. I mean, so many different ways that you could potentially do, even just the old tin can routine, right? That you used as kids to be able <laughs> yes. to talk, yeah. right? All of that stuff can be used and teams absolutely fear that type of stuff being used. Mm. Mm. Oh, I bet, I bet. Um, have any honeypots been used by NFL teams? Yeah, so um, I can't confirm that they have, but obviously, you know, anybody who's involved in the field of collecting and protecting information um, knows that this is the oldest trick in the book. Mm. So this an is another one where I wasn't able to find any stories in professional football, okay? But in college football, I absolutely did. Yeah, yeah. So... Barry Switzer, who was a coach at the university, a very famous coach at the University of Oklahoma, uh, revealed that one of his players came up to him at one point and said, Coach, I've got a problem. And then he revealed a story that was so astounding, it was, it was just baffling. Um, so he was, at, in, um, he was in a parking lot, team parking lot one day, 
and he was approached by a very attractive female who struck up a conversation with him. And they ended up going out together and eventually even moving in together. Okay? And so they, he goes through the whole season living with this lady who claims to be a member of the Dior family. That Dior family, the very wealthy yeah. Dior family, right? <laughs> and he thinks he's got it made. He's like, oh man, this is great. The last game of the season, the bowl goes, you know, they finish out the last bowl game of the season. And then he comes back to the apartment where they're living and it is cleared out. She's gone. Wow. It wasn't the fact of the physical stuff that's missing. It's like, what happened? Where'd she go? What is going mm. on? And um, he gets a tip off from the maid that was like, hey, she was meeting with some people. She was providing information to people, all this type of stuff. And it starts yeah. up basically an investigation that the University of Oklahoma conducts to try to figure out what's going on. And it ultimately, ultimately ties back to a reporter from Texas who's got ties to the University of Texas, their biggest rival, huge rival. It's called, you know, the Red River Showdown when those two teams play. And, and so it ended up being this reporter trying to gather information damning information on the University of Oklahoma program to try to ultimately try to shut down the entire program based on drug use and what's going on there and all of that. She was even recording conversations that were going on between players and all of that. So classic honeypot, you know? And so, yeah, to think that it doesn't go on, on go on in NFL circles, um, mm, mm. It, it does. It does. I, yeah. I couldn't, there wasn't a lot of information about this one incident, but there was another one where an NFL player actually invited a female back to his hotel room. She stayed the night. And then in the morning, the playbook that was in a safe is missing. It's gone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Safe cracker. So yes, honey pots are used. Yeah, gosh. I mean, it's quite, I don't know why it feels more shocking when it's in college football because it's younger people, but it's deeply, deeply unethical in many respects. It's really bad. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And that's where, you know, you get all the stuff where, is it unethical? Absolutely. Mm. But does it mm. break laws or does it break, um, you know, NFL guidelines? You know, in the case of cracking into a safe, Yes, probably, you know, um, it, it's at least illegal, I would say. But um, if you're stupid enough to allow a woman into your room like that, you know, that that you've never met, you know, just a few hours ago. Um, so, yeah, it gets it's very difficult to try to deal with that stuff when it's just unethical um yeah, because the yeah. nfl really doesn't have any legs to stand on at that point mm, indeed indeed so how common are espionage tactics within the nfl today and has our reliance on online communication maybe made attempts easier yeah so um overt collection attempts you know what's permissive um those are used week in and week out by nfl teams and there is um those are the big ones you know um they're very handy and they're very um, helpful. So you've got stuff like, um, you know, advanced scouting, debriefing players that switch teams uh, when one gets cut or one gets signed from another team. Uh, signals collection, obviously. Uh, today, mainly in the form of trying to collect on opponents audible, audible calls. Um, and then open source stuff. What's out there in the media? What's in newspapers? What do we see from interviews with players and coaches? Mm -hmm. Those go on all the time. All the teams use those types of tactics. And, and that's the bread and butter of NFL collection. Um, but obviously, there's the other stuff. There's the darker arts that go on as well. Um, and then, you know, so when it comes to online communication and does that make it easier to collect, um, I wouldn't say it's easier. What, what I've seen studying the NFL's history on this subject is that just like in the international world of espionage, the techniques and tactics have evolved. You know, as, as your opponent figures out what's going on, they evolve. They employ defensive countermeasures. And then the team that's trying to collect that information has to evolve their collection techniques as well. And then also, as technology evolves, it changes the game of espionage. Um, so to give a few examples of that, um, playbooks. You know, it used to be all on 
you know, pieces of paper, oftentimes bound together. Um, and teams would try to steal those playbooks. Nowadays, playbooks are predominant, predominantly placed on iPads, um, or at least on tablets. And it changes how collection is done. So are you going to try to steal another team's tablet? Well, yes, you could, mm. but um, then you've got to worry about a few things. One, if you do, um, are there location, is there location detection software on that tablet or iPad? Yeah. <laughs> because it can be traced back to you real quickly, right? Yeah, and they can get photographs of you too. <laughs> and get photographs of you and send them mm. right back to the team who they belong to. Um, other worries, um, those devices can be wiped very quickly. They can be password protected. They can be fingerprint protected. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ways to protect against those. So even if you get your hands on one of those, can you get that information out of it before your opponent wipes all that clean? Yes, maybe. Um, but another concern is, do you, you know, do you even need the device itself? So I spoke to a, a drone expert who told me, um, you know, and obviously drones are another concern because you can, the threat used to be use, use helicopters or planes to spy on practices from overhead, okay? Which was pretty far-fetched, I think. But drones are a much bigger threat because they're cheap, they're very easy to use, and you can get great clarity from pretty high up of what's taking place. So what this drone expert said to me is, Kevin, not only can I disguise and hide this drone so that teams are never, ever going to see what's happening, and I can, and I can broadcast everything that's going, that's going on on that practice field live back to team headquarters, which can record all of this that's taking place. But furthermore, if a team is using Wi-Fi with their tablet, or iPad that's down there on the field. He said, I can suck all that information out. And I said, okay, well, isn't that gonna be password protected? He's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Kevin. Like there is, password cracking software is so powerful. I'll have that thing cracked within 10 seconds. It's done. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah, done. Yeah. And then I, whatever is on that device, I can suck it up and I can send it back to team headquarters. And it's just that easy. So. You know, it comes down to team security. Are they smart enough not to be connected to Wi-Fi? Are teams smart enough not to co not to connect their computers that have sensitive information to the internet? You know, meaning, do they use standalone systems that aren't connected to the internet to make sure that teams can't hack in and be able to get this information? You know, it's it's all. It's like the international world of espionage. You got to be concerned about all that stuff when it comes to technology because it all is a threat. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry that's going on here. And just like industrial espionage and how companies steal from each other, teams are doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Are there any teams or individuals who've been the worst offenders in the use of espionage? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what you see, obviously we've got Bill Belichick today, and I think all NFL mm. fans are pretty aware of the shenanigans that he's been involved with in the yeah. current game. But what I saw st studying this subject was that there have been a long line of coaches throughout the NFL history that have been willing to cross that black line and, and, and to go into clearly illicit collection uh, capability. So, you know, Weeb Eubank, who I mentioned a little earlier, who was with um, the Colts and then later the Jets. Al Davis, who was with the Raiders. Um, he had some, you know, some great stuff, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about him a little later, I'm sure. But he's, yeah, he's one of the great, um, he was the Bill Belichick before Bill Belichick. Mm. Paul Brown, members of his coaching staff, he would dress up as reporters and send them to other teams' practices to watch what was going on. And George Hallis, who is considered by many to be the founder of the NFL and who was the first coach and owner of the Chicago Bears, they used to have Towboys back in the day. And whoever was the home team would have Towboys for both sides, okay? But what he was known to do was employ those Towboys and have them report back to him from the conversations that were held 
on the sidelines or in the locker room. And then they would come back and whisper his little secrets. They were his canaries and whispering secrets back to him about what was going on. So there's a long history of coaches that are willing to, you know, and these are just a list of a few of them. And that's those are the ones that are using completely illicit techniques. Tons and tons more coaches are using all those questionable, unethical, um, mm. you know, techniques mm. that go on as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Are there any individuals or opposing teams that have collaborated in espionage efforts? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I'll give you what I think is probably one of the better examples of that. Yeah. So it does. It goes on. And like I said, you know, I mentioned that they, um, you know, with Weave Eubank providing secrets to the Colts a little earlier. Um, but to give you another example of that type of stuff, back in 1957, um, the Lions under head coach George Wilson they paid a former Browns player to spy on practices leading up to the NFL championship. That was going to, that was going to be between those two teams. And, um, the player, um, who was desperate for money provided the lions with all the plays that the, that the, um, Browns planned to run in short yardage situations. And, um, because of that, Detroit not only knew the plays, that were going to be used in those situations, but also in what order the Cleveland Browns were going to run them. So in other words, once it was, once it was a short distance play, um, they knew exactly what play was going to be up coming. And mm-hmm. as a result of this, you know, the lions won that game 59 to 14. Um, was it the decisive factor? Maybe not, but did it absolutely contribute? Yes. And there, once again, you've got an insider of a team um, providing information to a, another team and um, all, about, all about the money. And people will say, oh, well, in today's NFL where players are paid, you know, at a bare minimum, you know, 300000 some and change a year and lots of players are making millions and millions a year, that wouldn't go on in today's NFL. Um, I, I can't tell you how lo- wrong that line of thought is and how many coaches have said, you know, um, you know, sometimes players are coming from, you know, a lot of NFL players are coming from very poor backgrounds and they're giving money to extended families or even communities sometimes like Samoan players, um, you know, really trying to support a whole tribe of people at times. And so they may make $2 million a year, but they may give $2.2 million back to an entire community. And at the end of the day, have to take out loans. And there are lots of incidences of coaches, you know, um, you know, sharing stories just like this. And so money is still a big factor in the NFL. And let's face it, we all know from international espionage, one of the easiest ways to get spies, especially for people that are, you know, desperate for money is to throw throw some change around out there. And, um, yeah. and so, yeah, it goes on. Definitely. Well, I, I remember reading that the average kind of career span for a player is about is it five years. And obviously for a coach, they can, you know, they can easily lose their livelihood very quickly if they're not, you know, kind of getting the results they need. You're absolutely right. And so, you know, the average, I think NFL lifespan is like three point something years. It's very short. Yeah. And then, so you've got a lot of people that didn't have a lot of money growing up, became wealthy very quickly, and then go back to really not having a lot of money. And what happens is a, a good chunk of them uh, go bankrupt very, very quickly and become desperate for money. And so, but a lot of them still are allowed access to team facilities. And so it's a it's it can be really really a bad situation for teams that let in these former players and if mm-hmm. i was a security mm-hmm. member for a team i would highly advise it against that um because you know you get these situations that are just you know it's a big threat it's a big threat and they've got access to almost everything you know they get access mm-hmm. to team meetings to practices to all of this they have the keys to the kingdom and aren't members of the team anymore, they're not getting a paycheck from a team and have so much incentive to provide information to opponents. And they have been targeted in the past. And I've got, you know, mm. I've got examples of that in, in my book, Spies on the Sidelines of, you know, just that type of stuff happening. Yeah, 
Yeah, indeed. Double agents. <laughs> yeah. Within the ranks. Yeah. Yep. No, not good. Do teams employ specialists in kind of counter surveillance as part of the uh, part of their security for their teams? And what kind of countermeasures are used to kind of guard their information? Yeah. So, I, you know, I think there what you're really looking at is, you know, do we have counter espionage specialists? Mm. Um, and mm. the answer to that is yes, no, and maybe so. Um, so all most teams have a head of team security. And typically that is a former FBI agent who will have some degree of training in, you know, investigations. Um, a lot of them, some degree of espionage. Mm. Um, you're going to have some guys that may, may have specialized in, you know, counter espionage investigations. You'll have some that have just, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's probably part of the basic training at Quantico, I'm imagining, is just, you know, real quick, hey, down and dirty, here's crash course on what is espionage, what do we do with it, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, yes, they know a bit about it, but they're not necessarily a guy who's spent a career specializing in that. Um, but they do have some tips and techniques to provide teams and help them out along the way. Having said that, mostly they're concerned with physical security physical security for the practice fields, for the headquarters buildings, for how do we safeguard our players and make sure that they are safe from crazies, you know, from people shooting others, even from inside insider threats. Um, just like we're worried about, you know, school shootings. Teams are worried about a football player, especially in today's NFL with all the concussions that are taking place, all the brain damage that goes on. Just having a player bring a gun into a facility um, is a threat. And so all of that goes on, and that's really what they're specializing in. Now, when it comes to the counter espionage bit and protecting information, mostly that's coaches or staff members that are worried about that. And obviously, they have no training in it whatsoever. So mm -hmm. often, it's amateur hour. And some of them are better than others, obviously. Um, I would, I, I, you know, I would make a case for teams that are spending, you know, that are worth billions and billions of dollars would be very, very wise to have specialists, you know, guys that have made a career out of this working for them and doing that. And some teams do, and some teams don't. And some teams like Al Davis employed a guy who, uh, Ron Wolf, who was a former um, clandestine agent in Berlin who knew how to do all of this high-speed stuff, collect information, protect information. And other teams are just winging it. Yeah, indeed. I suppose budgets might play a, a factor in some of that for some teams. For some teams, yes, uh, I'm sure. But, you know, like I said, when you're talking billions of dollars out there and the money that is thrown around just for, you know, silly stuff, mm. um, I, would, I would argue teams would be very wise to invest, you know, um, a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars in in hiring a specialist that mm, can mm. that can tackle this for them. Yeah, yeah. Have there been any teams or individuals who've rejected the use of espionage techniques outright? Yeah, you know, during my course of interviewing coaches, I'll tell you some that just like um, one told me, like for example, you know, basically they had found the playbook for another team, mm. and and he was like, I I don't feel comfortable using this. I don't want to. Mm. He told his head coach about it. And when the head coach was like, oh, heck yeah, we're going to use all of this. And like, yeah, you know, they're just, they're sitting around as a bunch of coaches just digesting it. Um, but he was like, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't feel good about this and I'm not going to do it. Um, you know, another example, when um, Eric Weddle, a, a, you know, a perennial Pro Bowl safety, he went from the Rams to the Ravens. And what he said when he went to that new team and was asked to share information, he said, you know, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, he said, my past team was really good to me. I like them. They're good. I, I, I've got nothing but respect. And I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to. Now, when you're a perennial pro bowler, you can get away with that. Okay? When you've just been signed on by a new team, and you are, maybe you were signed on just for the sole purpose of providing that information, which goes on all the time in the NFL, those coaches are just going to go, Hey, then get the heck out of here. We don't want you. Yeah. Your paycheck ends yeah. now. So to be a player and to be asked to do that, who's just 
clinging to an NFL career, right? Hmm. It, man, you're going to, you're going to roll over on your former team almost every single time. Yeah. So yeah, you can say no, but it doesn't happen very often. And, um, and most teams are, they're pretty aggressive at going after that type of information. Yeah. Yeah. How does the NFL keep the game fair? And are there any sort of penalties for teams who are caught conducting espionage attempts? And how does the NFL go about kind of investigating accusations of espionage? So the NFL tries to keep it eh, fair-ish at times. Mm. So they're really not concerned with any of the permissible collection techniques. They're just like, that's fair game, man. You got to watch your back and, and take your appropriate countermeasures because we're not doing anything there. Okay. Same goes really for the questionable stuff, right? Um, like use, use of a lip reader. They're just going to go, man, you, you need to be covering your mouth then. Okay. Like that's, that's just, it is what it is. Collection signals collection, you know, um, such as calling out audibles at the line of scrimmage. Well, if the other team can figure them out, well, you need to be changing them from time to time. You need to employ tactics so that, you know, even though you call out an audible, there's a method that teams use ultimately that basically says, they may say something like red before they change the play mm -hmm. on the audible. And red means, mm -hmm. it means R is the audible I'm about to call. Are we going to use it or not? Mm -hmm. Because just because I say 42 blue Hershey, doesn't mean we're going to use 42 blue Hershey. If I say red 42 blue Hershey, that means red means yeah, cancel everything I'm about to say. Yeah. We're not we're not we're just going to stick with the original play call that I made in the huddle. Okay? So, you know, so there are techniques that teams use to protect it and the NFL just expects them to to do that. However, um there are also, you know, like when it comes to the use of listening devices or mm. when it comes to recording other team signals. The NFL has guidelines and policies that say, hey, if you if you as a team break these, there's there's gonna be a punishment um, that goes on. And there's all also, you know, laws, state laws, federal laws against some of these activities that are um, used or at least are suspected of being used. So there are penalties, it varies from what's being done. Um, and sometimes, you know, the NFL has a history. So let's take, for example, spying on practices. Is the yeah. NFL going to come down on that? There's really no policy on that. It comes down to basically the NFL could punish another team for it under fair play rules, which are just kind of general guidelines of, hey, we expect you to act in good faith and, you know, and show, you know, good ethics. Well, that leaves a lot to just be up to the, the NFL commissioner's discretion on if he's going to punish an NFL team or not. And sometimes NFL commissioners will punish things like that. Sometimes they're just like, eh, it happens. Lots of teams have done it. Lots of teams are going to do it. And we're just going to let it go. And so it becomes one of those things that it's just, it's just the call of whoever's the commissioner at the time. So there is a, a whole lot of gray, a ton of gray when it comes to, you know, the techniques that NFL teams can use and are they going to be punished for it or are they not? And so what I find as a result is teams are for the, a lot of times they're very aggressive because they're just like, well, until the NFL is going to make a, a strong ruling against that, we're just going to keep on doing it. And I think that's what you saw with the Patriots and Spygate um, for so many years was just like, look, until the NFL comes down, and really, mm -hmm. you know, comes out with some definitive rules, we're going to keep doing it. And even when they did, they didn't make a rule. They just put out a memo saying, hey, don't do it. And I think the Patriots said, well, all there is is a memo. There's not a rule. And we're going to keep doing it until there, there is a rule. And ultimately, they were punished based on the memo. But, you know, the NFL would be very um, well served to put in some more rules about this if they don't want it to take place but I just don't know if they really care. Yeah, that's a shame. Have any espionage attempts that you've looked into personally stood out for you? I mean, there's a ton of great ones that I've got, you know, in the book. There's so many. Uh, I'll give you a, you know, fairly recent one that I think a lot of people would enjoy. So Peyton Manning, he may be the most renowned NFL quarterback in history. Um, 
And so he was always known, he, you know, his nickname was the sheriff, right? Yeah. He has this good guy persona, especially since his nemesis was always Tom Brady, who played for the Patriots and, you know, were seen as the bad guys of the NFL. So what Peyton Manning used to do was when he would go to the Pro Bowl, which is, you know, you bring all the NFL's best players together to basically play an all-star game for a bunch of fun. Mm. What he would do is he would invite players to come drink with him and have a bunch of Mai Tais when it's played, you know, the game's played in Hawaii. So, you know, the the tropical drink of a Mai Tai is very popular. (laughs) And Peyton Manning would pay for everybody's drinks, okay, out of the goodness of his heart. But what he would do once everyone, you know, once his fellow drinkers had a little too much to drink, he would turn the conversation to football. And he would try to ferret out a few secrets from opponents that he would play. You know, such as, hey, Jim, you know, when I'm dropping back to pass and whatnot, you know, what are you looking at? Are you watching me? Are you watching my cornerback? Are you, you know, what exactly, you know, what's going on? Whatever this topic is, you know, he would just try to ferret out a few secrets. And, you know, he tried to do this with a a Patriots uh, safety, Ty Law, who said, you know, hey, Peyton, you know, I'm not falling for that. You know, I I know exactly what you're doing here. So, So obviously some people caught on to it. But this is just the show, you know, even those guys and those coaches and players that are seen as the good guys of the NFL that, you know, we as fans think, oh, you know, he would never, he never stoop to something like that. Even those guys have their little tricks up their sleeves and it's a game, man. They're, everybody's doing this stuff. Everybody is doing this thing to try to give their team that advantage because, especially Mm -hmm. in today's NFL where the majority of games are settled by seven points or less, the slightest little advantage Mm. can make all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Has your research had an effect on your interest in NFL football? Um, I I, I would say ultimately, no, it was eye opening to learn just how much stuff goes on Mm. being, you know, I, I, I like to read about, you know, um, all those, you know, spy books and spy stories, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, um, you know, I think it's just an interesting genre to me. And this just kind of add a new wrinkle, add a new flavor yeah. to the NFL, you know, gave it a little more depth and context to me. And, um, you know, I think if you're a fan of any sport, you like knowing what goes on behind the scenes. And that's what I tried to provide was what's going on pre- behind the scenes for a subject that's really not talked about with sports before. And I think no matter what sport you're a fan of, you know, when you read this, because even if you're, you know, let's say you're English Premier League fan, okay, so much stuff out of this book could be applied to what's going Mm. on in the profession, you know, the game of professional, you know, British soccer, you know, British football, you know, because a lot of this same stuff is happening in all of the leagues around the world. Mm. Mm, no indeed well um is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today no you know just like i mentioned i think it's a it's a little it's a little different take for anybody who's a sport fan out there Mm. and even if you're not not a sport fan i've tried to and, and if you don't understand football at all i wrote this book in a manner so that anyone can understand it and enjoy it and if you like sports or you just like you know espionage tales um, I think you're really going to enjoy the book because I've, I've tried to write this for a mass audience um, and not just NFL fans. Um, and, and I've had quite a few people who aren't sports fans at all. Mm. Don't follow mm. football. Tell me, you know, I was really surprised how much I enjoyed that book because, you know, and, and, you, and I've tried to keep all the terminology really simple for you and all of that yeah i think you did a great job i mean i'm i don't know much about nfl football i I used to watch it a little bit as a teenager back in the day um and i i know i thought you did a very good job it was very interesting very interesting thank you appreciate one last uh thing because we're on the eve of the super bowl uh do you have any thoughts on this this year's super bowl yeah so um i'm picking the eagles uh, Philadelphia Eagles beat Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, I think they're a little stronger team across the board. Having said that, I think it's going to be a really close game. Um, obviously, you know, when it comes down to the two best teams in the league, it's usually going to be a close game. Uh, they're, you know, they're the two powerhouses. Um, having said that, you know, I think Kansas City, though, 
They've got a couple of the X factors. Um, Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes is, all, I think he's the best quarterback in the NFL. He's a little banged up right now. He's injured. Um, so, but that guy just, he's, you know, he's like a John Elway or a Dan Marino, those legendary quarterbacks of old that can just, if they have the ball at the end of a game, they're going to win, you know? And, and also the, the Chiefs have Andy Reid, who used to, you know, he's the Chiefs coach now, but he used to coach for the Eagles. So, yes. you know, one, he's been in lots of Super Bowls. He knows what he's doing. He's been in a ton of big games. And two, the question is, in my mind is, what does he know about his former team that could be helpful? Mm-hmm. You know, it could just be strengths and weaknesses of players uh, that are still around there or how do coaches think about the game? How are they going to be preparing for them? You know, and to get in their mind and, and to, you know, uh, go against them because coaches are playing a game of chess. Mm. And so, you know, I think that's a very interesting aspect of the game as well. Yeah, excellent. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Where can listeners find out more about you and your book? Yeah, so my website is spiesonthesidelines.com. You can pick up the book basically at any of the big book retailers that are, you know, online. So, you know, in the UK, um, any of your any of your big retailers are going to have it over there. Amazon's got it here in the States, you know, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Walmart even has it. Um, I've got, I think it's five or six at least of the big retailers over in the UK are, have it and are selling it. Um, yeah, if you, if my website's got all my social media handles. So if you're interested in following me, I've got all of that. The book's out in hardbound, ebook and audiobook, And, you know, the website's got all the different ways, who's carrying it, where you can buy it and whatnot. But um, I know everybody gets everything today on Amazon. So you can get everything on Amazon if that's what you want. So, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been great to have you on. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 